you can clap better than that. Uh, all right, let's do Chris Pratt. How are you? Come on. <laughs> That's a bit better, but let's go for Zoe Saldana, and then maybe quickly afterwards, Dave Bautista as well. <laughs> and then there's James Gunn, the director of the piece. <laughs> Mike's all working, everyone. Uh, Vin can't be here just now. Hopefully he'll be here shortly. He had a stilt mishap. <laughs> that does happen. Now, I'm going to kick things off with a question for everyone, a classic first base one, but let's just do it. I'd love to know how you guys all individually got involved with the project and what appealed to you, the roles in particular, because they're all quite different, I'd say. Maybe kick things off with Karen, do you mind? Oh, um, well, I just got a call from my agent and they were like, are you willing to shave your head for a role in a Marvel film? And I said, absolutely. Um, and then I just auditioned. Um, and then a few auditions, <laughs> this is a boring story. <laughs> and then I met, <laughs> how can I make this interesting? And then I met James um, in the studio, Shepherdson, where we shot the film. And it was really exciting. And then I did a screen test and got the role. It was really appealing. <laughs> And, she was, Chris, and I, I told her the other day in person, Karen's audition is my favorite, or her screen test is my favorite, sorry guys, but her screen <laughs> test is my favorite audition of anybody in the, the entire process was, you know, her, her audition was my favorite, it's oh, the coolest. Thanks man. <laughs> I gotta ask why. Because she was so good, it was like she took this character that was a pretty simple character and it was, uh, you know, a little bit, of, it was a pretty long sequence and it was just very, it was actually very moving, this, this, this character that she created out of this bald cyber jerk. <laughs> so cyber I liked jerk. it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that it's in, you know, her, her character is sort of, we think of her, oh, she's almost like the Boba Fett of the movie. And she has uh, some, just these little moments in the movie where you can see that there's a lot more to this character than just being a villainess. Boba Fett, big shoes to fill, for sure. Oh, uh, Chris, can you beat Karen's story? How was your screen <laughs> test? Did you know from the off that you were ready for this? Um, I, I figured if I could just get them to believe me physically as a character that it would be mine. I really felt like uh, James and I gelled in a nice way and seemed to have the, like, almost immediately I felt like I was right, like my spirit was right for this character and the way I sounded was the way he'd sound. I just didn't look the, I didn't look the part and I wasn't walking around in like the, the right vehicle yet. And so I knew if I could convince them that they could take a chance on me and give me, given it enough time, I'd be able to make a, phys like create the, you know, change that was required to look like the character I knew I would get the part and so. So, and I also had an inside in because my friend, Ben, who was essentially reading the role of Drax for all of the other screen tests is like one of my very best friends. And he's also one of my best friends. Yeah, and we were really, and he was like, he's like, dude, you can't, Pratt, you can't tell anyone, but it's totally yours. Like, <laughs> no one has come in and did what you did. You're going to get it. I was, I was like, oh, that's good. Wow. Well, I told I told Ben, I was like, oh, this, I want, I'm just, I am just now just like trying to, check the boxes to get Pratt into the role so that uh, he, he, can, uh, he can be hired by Marvel and, and they can agree to, to hire him. Um, with Dave, it was, a, Dave, it was the same thing. I knew, you know, the, the interesting thing with, of me with all four of these actors here is, you know, I, I think back along the journey and with each one of them, like the minute we met, there was something very like just sincere between each of us. The first time I met, you know, Dave in that audition room, I just really got Dave. Chris and I had common friends and we met each other. You know, Karen, I remember, you know, hanging out in my office and just laughing our asses off and that, that first day we met. And then Zoe on the phone, who's a, going a thousand miles a minute uh, when I was on the phone with you and just totally just got along really well. So it's, it's one of those cool things where you, still love everybody at the end of the project that you, you know, liked so much at the beginning. And that's probably the coolest thing about this movie for me. It sounds like you had a great rap party with that kind of uh, chemistry between you guys. Um, uh, you know, we were all <laughs> kind of gone I, from I the missed, rap party. I miss the rap party. Yeah. I always miss rap parties. Like, I always have to leave the day of the rap party. And then I hear the stories. But it's a good thing that I don't go to the rap party because I tend to rap the party, too. <laughs> 
Yeah, Dave and Dave. No, Dave and me, because you've got you, no, I mean, you, pro you protected my brother from a guy that was trying to beat him up. <laughs> Dave. I can't believe I missed it. <laughs> Dave has. There was a guy. <laughs> should, I, should I not tell the story? I don't know, man. There's a guy who. <laughs> there's a guy who was like a crew member who was bothering a bunch of people, and he came up and he was like offering me drugs, and I don't even drink, and I was like, what are you, you know? Get away from me. And then he was, you know, he like, you know, grabbed the, the, the little person who played, uh, who was like the reference for Rocket on set. He grabbed her, he, R RT. And then he, there was another girl, uh, Abby, who was one of the stand ins, and he grabbed her butt. And my brother Sean, who plays Craglin in the movie and who was on the on set rock, uh, Rocket, who was not a big guy, uh, you know, got in this guy's face, and he was a big guy. And he's like, you know, what, what, what are you doing? And, I, and somebody ran over to me and said, your brother's about to get into a fight. And I walked over to the guy, and I'm like, you know, you got to get out of here. You know, leave, because he grabbed, you know, this, 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 this girl. And then Artie, who was uh, the stand and came up and said, James, he picked me up by the tits. <laughs> and I said, whoa. And Dave was there, and Dave said... What's the problem? And then this big guy came marching over to Dave, and he's like about to get in Dave's face. And Dave has actual superpowers, so it's pretty cool. And Dave just went like this with his hand, and he went, Look boom. at his hand, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he it's went, not just like a hand. He, he tapped the guy like, like this, <laughs> and then the guy flew back like 30 feet. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. It was actual superpowers that Dave has. And I was pretty, I was pretty excited. Um, when, you times. Ask, when you ask someone how the rap party was, that is not the answer you expect. <laughs> I think it's time for some, of, some questions from you guys. If you'd like, well, there you have to. Me too. It yeah. just, I mean, he stole the show when we started working. I just had a soft spot for that big tree. He was so, he unconditionally loved us all and um and even though you know i'm mature and i'm pretty sane and i'm i'm an actor wah, wah. um <laughs> uh, you know and you go okay this is make believe i know it's a fictional character he moved me in such a way that i was like screw that like i just i want to believe that he's real because what he's making me feel is very real so that's group we have yeah. one for group yeah i think when i think for me i mean you know, when the movie for me, when the movie really takes off is the is when we we zoom in on the Xandar Mall and we meet Rocket and Groot together, and you see Groot drinking out of the fountain, and you see Rocket with you know looking through his vid screen for potential bounties, and that to me is the moment that like there's this synergy that happens. Like you take all of the parts that Peter Quill, you've met Gamora, we you know I don't think at that point we've met Drax yet, but you see like somehow the sum is greater than the whole and and it's when rocket is talking and he sees like the little kid and he's like who's this little guy like look at this little you know it's not cool to need help or, you know and it's like <laughs> it becomes really fun and you just you see that this world you, you know this journey is going to be really good so i'd say rocket i think rocket probably in that moment steals the show for me I suppose, James, for you, it's like picking your favorite kid, isn't it? Well, I have my favorite kid. It's Rocket, but I don't know if he necessarily <laughs> steals the show. It's, uh, I, 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 for me, in some ways, I, I think, you know, Groot, I, I just go by the tweets I get, and it's, it, you know, and, and frankly, I get more tweets about Groot and Batista than anybody else. I also like, I like to say it's Batista that steals the show because it embarrasses him. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so he's the one person I like to compliment as much as possible because he hates it. <laughs> but really, you know, uh, it, it, I, I think everybody steals it. You know, Chris obviously has emerged as a giant movie star from this movie, which is incredible. And Zoe is kind of the Clint Eastwood. And I'm she's already so a cool, movie star. You know? <laughs> yeah, you are already a movie star. <laughs> And Karen is just so visually arresting. I think of her as like just this, just this, she has this gigantic like beauty and charisma that's just so present. Um, Rocket's, you know, maybe the funniest and Groot is the soul of the movie. And then, you know, Batista comes in and he's just the most unique character in the whole movie. And he's so funny and there's nobody else in the world that could play that role. 
Um, so it, it's, you know, and actually one of the comments I got the most like on Twitter and Facebook from people who've seen the movie is that everybody kind of steals the movie in turn and it really is an ensemble piece. Uh, and I think that's what makes it so good. There isn't that one character who everybody says, oh, it's this one guy. It's really the dynamism between the characters together that works more so than any individual character. Or it's the prosthetic leg. Which, which is, means the director. Yeah, sure. Saying that it's not easy being green. How did you find it? Um, <clears throat> let me tell you something. When you think of things that are sexy, uh, they're usually in pink or black or white or red. Uh, they're not in green. The, the, we don't even like vegetables. Half of us don't even eat vegetables. And they're green. So I, we, we started out with a really tough, in a very tough position. And, I, and I, I've never approached a character on a superficial level in terms of like, yeah, make your tits bigger and, and make the jeans tighter around the butt. And this time, you should have been in the, in the wardrobe room when I was having a fitting. I was like, no, Alex, you just pad them up more. Yeah, you just make them like there, like out here. And the ass, get that wedgie just perfect. I was really concerned because I thought, if my character has to bring all the fanboys and find it appealing, we like things that are aesthetically beautiful, especially if it comes in a form of a woman. And you know, green or Martians, swamp things are green, boogers are green, it's like, you know. <laughs> so we, I was adamant about finding that right shade. And Dave, I've, Dave, I've got to ask you, you know, being gray, what's it like? The, the tribal tattoos fascinate me. How hard is it to get that on every morning? He was, oh, sorry, I'm Karen still stuck on boogers time. are green. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I made long lists. Yeah, no, it was okay. It, was, um, it wasn't nearly as bad as people think for some reason because I'd really uh, become close with my makeup team. Mm. And uh, so the comparison I like to make is if you could... You know, imagine yourself just hanging out with five of your friends for four hours and having, you know, some good conversation and a lot of laughs and listening to good music. It, it kind of flies by, yeah. Yeah, you know, but if true. it was more of the consecutive days rather than the hours uh, in the chair, it was like when it got to be like three, four, five, six days in a row, then your skin just got real sensitive and kind of raw and you just wanted that day off to feel clean, you know, take a shower and stop digging gunk out of your ears and blowing <laughs> stuff out of your nose. Yeah. Did you blow green out of your nose? Well, for like a month. <laughs> we wrapped, but yeah, like no, month. it wasn't as, as bad as, as you would think. That's Who, good. You just, mostly because you have a good attitude, though. It's like, it didn't, you yeah, just need to I'm go pretty in. patient. Zen. Yeah, because yeah. kind of yeah. he's really, he was for like, he'd have to have his arms outstretched like this for long yeah. periods of time, yeah. and it's, uh, to me, it would be absolute hell because I have to be moving all the time. It would be very difficult. But I think one of the, with, with the green, the interesting thing for me is like, um, if I had to go back, I would really consider, you know, even though she's green in the comic books, changing her color because it was so hard. It took us so long to find a green that like works you guys wouldn't tests. believe because we found you know right away you know we have other characters who are blue you know Yandu and Ronan are both blue and Nebula's blue we have other characters who are you know yellow. smaller characters who are yellow we have other characters who are pink and we found all of those colors were sort of you know natural to human beings in a strange sort of way you could find a color that looked like skin and green was really hard um, and it just took a long time. It really was a struggle. Yeah, like I remember some of the, some like being in the makeup uh, room and seeing some of the tests, and it was like a lighter shade of green, and then she just looked like she was seasick. Yeah. And it was like a darker shade of green. It was like, that looks like someone got painted green. Yeah, That's, exactly. That look That's what good it was, at all. They, they look painted. So it was, yeah, it was like, Green you know. is, is not a natural color that looks good on the skin, so it was really, you know, hard. It's a, you know, and it's a testament to Zoe's facial features, too, that it ends up looking as good as it does. I, I'm guessing, Karen, you had the longest in the makeup. Did I? Did yeah. you? Five hours. Yeah. You I didn't have to stand up and put my arms out, though. I just watched Pulp Fiction on repeat. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Fair enough. Uh, next question is going to be from... Um, they're, they're really, you know, the truth is the songs that were chosen for the movie were chosen to be specific to those scenes. So it isn't so much about what, you know, 
what songs I like the best as it is about what songs speak to that scene. And all those songs were written into the script um, except for one. And so they were, you know, all part, they're sort of baked into the story of the Guardians of the Galaxy, which is what makes it work so well. So for me to think of a song that I like a lot that I want to put in the movie, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it works. I mean, one of my favorite scenes in the movie was to ELO's Living Thing, which we cut from the film. And it, that was, to me, Living Thing was like the main Guardian song because it was so, ELO seemed like the Guardian's house band almost. <laughs> and uh, now there's no ELO song in there, but it still, it works really well because the movie works better without that scene. We need some ABBA in it. We need some hollow notes and uh, some air supply. Uh, I had used air supply in Slither, so I, 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 I yes, paid my did. air supply debt. That was debt. fabulous. I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing Peter Quill try to seduce somebody to like Lionel Richie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like put it on like he's a Mac. Like like, a Hello. It's me you're looking for, and they're just like, like super serious, and play it real. Like that's how he's been getting with all these familians. It's just like this one line on Some purple track. girl. Some purple girl, and she's just like crying because it's so beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing she's ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> just super easy to hook up with Familians. It's all you need is Lionel Richie. See, this is, this is what we do, guys. Anyway. Familians. It is really a fact that Familians love Lionel Richie. Yeah, everyone knows that. Yeah. I just really want to ask what song we'll be playing when you kill Iron Man. I mean, probably not Lionel Richie. Hello. <laughs> is it me all looking? <laughs> <laughs> Credits roll. <laughs> Seven minutes into the movie, it's over. <laughs> totally <laughs> worth <Dead>. it. <laughs> and then the rest of the movie is like a weekend at Bernie's yeah, type thing with Robert Downey Jr.'s body <laughs> to keep to make him the most out of his contract. It's skittering across the desert uh, with the Iron Man <laughs> thrusters on. Yeah. He's flopping around. <laughs> his body, his dead body in the Iron Man costume. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. Yes, somebody get up and ask, ask a question. It's a not, this is gonna, we're going to keep going all the all way right, through all right, lunch. All right. I'm, I'm taking control this, of the situation. This is what it was like. One, on more set, question, let, no, one more question. Let's have a relatively serious one, if that's possible. Um, <laughs> this lady. Um, first off, thank you for having a raccoon in the film. Um, because you've got the raccoon in the film, Oreo is now coming to my wedding. So, thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> yes, Oreo Raccoon is the, uh, he's the uh, rescue raccoon. He was rescued when he was only... I think four days old and hand fed, and he's uh, the raccoon who came with me. He's my date to the premiere last night, um, and he was the reference raccoon for uh, Rocket, and he, he's a real sweet little guy. And I actually, after the premiere, I went over there and he tackled me and, and ripped my suit, but that's all right. <laughs> On the wedding day, so yeah, you be, be careful. Suits. He's very he he's very nice. He'll never try to hurt you. Yeah, I have met him. But he likes to wrestle. Yeah. Um, but my question is, um, it's for everybody. But Chris, your character Che in the OC um, had an otter as his spirit animal. I was just wondering what each guardian's spirit animal would be. Wow. Uh, what what is she's your spirit talking animal? about? Some of, she's talking about this like uh, really profound season of the OC where my character. <laughs> My character, Che Winchester, uh, had a spirit animal, uh, which was an otter, and um, it's really deep. It's like really kind of a subversive, uh, I mean, actually, if you have a, a, like 45 minutes, I could kind of walk you through the episode. Um, uh, no, yeah, but that's a really good question. I, if everyone, what, what's your spirit animal? What's your character's spirit animal would be the question. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have an answer? I'd what? like to point out I asked for a serious question. But. <laughs> um, you know, I guess for me, my spirit, Peter Quill's spirit animal would probably be like a uh, golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. I see that. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. I see that. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he goes, he's a pup. He's like a puppy in a way, you know? He's still kind of that nine year old boy that got taken away. But, he, but he's like, ah, screw it. I'm going to chase my tail and chase frisbees. You know? <laughs> Anyone else? I think um, usually I always find an animal for all the characters that I play. I just feel like uh, people, we do also have animal personalities and, and, uh, and that's a good way of getting to know somebody on a primal level. Uh, but this time Gamora wasn't an animal. Um, you may think it's a, re a reptile, but it wasn't. Um, she was more of a bullfighter for me. Because obviously a woman cannot out out fight a man with her strength, but she can outwit him. So 
I thought bullfighters definitely uh, uh, seduce a bull into surrendering into the sword, which obviously is not is not something that I appreciate deeply. But the psychological journey of that uh, moment is is something worth just uh, just observing and noticing. So I just thought, well, if she's a woman, she's not going to be stronger than a lot of, of of her opponents, but she's definitely going to be wittier. And so yeah. How about you, Dave? What's what's your spirit animal? My spirit animal? Yeah. Uh, for Drax? Yeah, is it a bull? No, it'd probably be something like a, a big dumb dog, a, like Great Dane or something like that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Are you going to go for another dog here, Karen? What are you going to pick? I, I mean, what animal takes itself way too seriously? Maybe like a sloth. No, that's... Those are passive. Um, maybe... I don't know. What's a really serious animal? Like a tiger? I think you're like a shark. Shark. That one. <laughs> a cybernetic shark. Yep. Uh, all right. Um, Chris, those are some impressively smooth dance moves you do. Devastating dance moves. Um, <laughs> did you come up with the choreography yourself? Um, you, y yes, yes, I did. That was sort of a you know kind of a throwback. I think like I like everything about Peter Quill. It had to be 1988 or earlier, and so I thought of a lot of Michael Jackson, some moves from the disco era, a little bit of early hip hop and, and stuff like that. So I remember uh, around that time in my life, my brother and I would have dance offs in our, in our basement. <laughs> and so uh, there was sort of that spirit in it a little bit. But yeah, those are were, those were my moves and uh, oddly never got paid as a choreographer. Um, <laughs> at least not yet, so. Well, okay, we've got just Thank some you. time for a couple more. Um, this gentleman here. James, they say that movies are made three times in the script when it's shot and then editing. I'm sure. wondering, with a, a presence like this, this film where there wasn't a huge notoriety for the characters in advance, whether you had slightly more freedom to shape it in a way personally rather than necessarily the way a studio would do for really well-known characters. D did I get the chance to do that? Is that what How the question? important really was it because, it's, because you're introducing the characters rather than reflecting existing characters? Yeah, I mean, that, for me, that was the whole appeal of this project in the first place was to create not just a world, but many worlds. And I think I would have a very hard time doing like a sequel to another Marvel movie or even setting up another character to be in the Avengers. But I felt a lot of freedom in creating this, this movie. And I'm very, very grateful to Marvel because every time I came up with some crazy idea, I'm like, you know, let's just have a seven page scene where the characters argue about stupid stuff at the beginning of the third act. And Marvel's like, oh, that's great. We love it. Or, you know, let's, you know, just have all these bright colors like old 50s and 60s movies. And they're like, we love it. And I'm like, let's add Michael Rooker, who's totally insane, and put him in the role of Yandu. And they're like, we love it. Um, and it's just like they really, for some reason, you know, I was allowed to go hog wild. And uh, it, it's been an amazing experience. And I, I know for all of us, um, unless they're, you know, being dishonest with me, which I don't believe they are, this has felt like a special movie to all of us from the very beginning. And it just was sort of the flavor of it. The flavor of it was, was special. And we felt like we were doing something that was both very new, very unique, and then also harken back to the films that we all loved as a kid. I mean, one of my favorite moments is showing Zoe some scenes uh, during the dubbing scene. She's like jumping around like a little kid because it was like, I remember how I felt when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark when I was a little kid or Empire Strikes Back. And or Spaceballs. <laughs> space <balls. laughs> <laughs> so it was fun the only to, one with to create, you know, to create that sort of thing and, and try to make something that's, you know, so many movies today are so dark and brooding to be able to create something that's a little bit, you know, more fun, but yet also has the emotional weight and the, 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 the you know, the heart to it as well. One last question. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks. To, it's great to have you here. I love the film. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, for James, I think this is one of the best marketed campaigns for a Marvel film that I've seen. And I recognize that some of the footage we saw in the trailers wasn't in the final film. So how much footage can we expect to see in deleted scenes? And then for the cast, um, was there any particular scene that you filmed which didn't make the cut that you would have liked to have made the cut? There's, um, there's a few uh, deleted scenes that we have um, 
that uh, aren't in the movie, and um, there are also outtakes of things that, because we would goof around a lot on set doing things, and sometimes those are used in the trailer as well. Um, and, and so, uh, the, I forgot your question. <laughs> Which deleted scenes do you wish you could have Well, what, no, there was another question before that. Marketing. Oh, the marketing, the marketing's amazing. Like, the truth is, I I'll be completely honest with you, like, we went out and we tested those original trailers that we did for the movie. We had like a really like mainstream one that made it look all serious and that these guys were like, you know, made it look like a very just normal like science fiction space movie. And then we had the trailer that we did with Hooked on a Feeling and all of that stuff. And we took them out to malls and showed people and people were kind of like, I don't like any of these, you know? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and so we're like, well, if they hate them all, then we might as well go with the one that is most honest and true to the film, which was the Hooked on a Feeling one, which really gave you a flavor of what the movie was. And it just shows you that stuff is all bullshit because people then love the trailer. We beat every other movie, and you know, we had, you know, in, the, in our time slot, we had three times the amount of hits that Man of Steel had on the first day, and nobody knows who the Guardians of the Galaxy are. So it worked really well, and it was just because it was true to the movie, and that's been our philosophy every step of the way. And, and this is really a testament to, you know, I've, I've, I've given tribute to, to Marvel, but it's, it's Disney, the Disney marketing team, who decided to have the balls to just kind of sell this movie as what it is and not try to make it into something else that's more palatable to what they think of as middle America. And, um, and that has been a, a pretty cool experience. And, and marketing, you know, the test would have said, don't do that. And they did it. And somehow, well, we'll find out if it worked in a couple days. But it, <laughs> it seems to have worked pretty well. Scenes. There's, there's, uh, there's, there are a couple of scenes that we shot, uh, Gamora and Nebula, where you sort of explain uh, that dysfunctional relationship that Ronan and Nebula and Gamora had uh, by being abducted and forced into a life of crime and violence by Thanos and his group of uh, thugs. And, um, and it, it, I, I would love to, to see that in the DVD. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Thank you all for coming to this um, rather uproarious press conference. I'm sure Vin Diesel is about to spring in at any moment, but yes. this, th this, this has been uh, the Guardians Galaxy press conference here in London. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming down. Thank you. Thanks, guys.